Hello, welcome to the Evolving Wellness Podcast. My name is Sarah. Today, I'm answering questions that were submitted over on my YouTube channel. I opened it up to my newsletter subscribers. So if you're not on my list and you want to get on there, make sure you follow the link down in the show notes. I have been making a really big effort to write educational articles with lots of scientific resources provide free guides, PDFs, all kinds of cool stuff, and just pack the newsletter full of value. And that's really what I want to do with the podcast also is try to bring value and put out information for free that might otherwise be behind a paywall. So I put out a newsletter about two days ago with an invitation to submit questions, and I've gotten over 200 questions. So I won't be able to get to all of those, but I'm going to do my best to get to the ones that I'm seeing a repeating theme or perhaps I have not addressed on a previous Q&A. If you've been listening to the show for the last few years, you know I'm a huge fan of red light therapy. There are over 10,000 studies now in publication showing the health benefits of red light therapy. And there is a lot of research showing how red light therapy can help to improve skin health. I have been on the fence about trying one of the red light therapy face masks, and I've definitely been waiting to find one that uses the specific frequencies that actually show improvement with skin health, 630 nanometers for red and 850 nanometers for near infrared and bond charge checks off all of those boxes. So I've been trying this mask out for the last month and I absolutely love it. It's super lightweight. It does not make your face sweat and it's very simple to use. All you need is 10 minutes. You can actually use my code Sarah Kleiner, all one word, to save 15% off at Bond Charge. You can use it on any of their products, but I really, really like their red light therapy face mask, and I think it's something that's worth a try if you're looking to naturally improve your skin health. So check it out. Again, use code Sarah Kleiner, all one word, to save 15% over at Bond Charge. Cortisol is a big buzzword these days, and I have made several videos to talk about this topic, but here's the thing. Cortisol is supposed to be nice and high in the morning and then drop gradually throughout the day. And so when people talk about high cortisol being the root cause of weight gain, insomnia, and hormone imbalance, there is a bit of truth to that. But if you don't actually test your cortisol to see what it's doing throughout the day, you don't really know what's going on. And if you take an adaptogen to lower cortisol and it's not actually high, you could have unpleasant results. That's why I am partnering with Cyfox Health to give you an at-home cortisol test that you take throughout the day. So you can see what's it doing in the morning, what's it doing midday, and what's it doing again in the evening when it's supposed to be nice and low so that you can get good sleep and have optimal metabolism. If you go to Cyfox Health, dot com backslash Sarah, you can save 20% on your at-home cortisol test. They also have an at-home blood test where you can test over 17 different biomarkers. Again, you'll go to Cyphox, S-I-P-H-O-X, health.com backslash Sarah to save 20% off when it comes to your cortisol, when it comes to your hormones, test and don't guess. Before I start... A quick little reminder that none of this is medical advice or substitute for working one-on-one with someone. With a lot of this stuff, you might hear me say this is a situation where you really want to talk to somebody. I want you to talk to someone that can understand your health history, the state of your nervous system, where you live, what your individual goals are, time of year. There's so much that goes into giving someone a good answer to their question A lot of it is very context dependent and on the internet, that's not a sexy, flashy thing to say. It depends, depends on your age, where you live, what your goals are, your health history. So I'm going to do my best to answer a lot of these. I've also had a lot of questions to do a little update on my daughter because I've talked about her in previous episodes So I'll do that quickly here in the very beginning because that was a question that came up over and over again was, how's your daughter? How's everything going? Um, So I'll do that first before I jump into the question. So thank you so much for being here, for listening to the podcast, listening to the show. I really, really appreciate this community. Anytime I share about something from my personal life, it is it's hard on my nervous system. I used to do a lot of that back in the day, and I, I do less and less of it as 
the show has grown, as my community has grown, because it, I realized it can take a big toll on my nervous system. But I did open up back in May in the Q&A episode about my daughter and talking about our issues with pans pandas mold, multiple diagnoses, a week in the ICU, just all kinds of things. So I'll put a link in the show notes if you haven't listened to that already to kind of get a background of what's been going on with her, then make sure you head to the show notes to check out that link so you can catch up and say, what, why, why is she talking about this? So essentially, we started using the Holy Hydrogen machine with her in January of this year after I did an interview with Greg the Hydrogen Man, and it was pretty much life-changing. Uh, we had been told that the only thing that would help her would be these uh, treatments called IVIG, which I have quite a few reservations about to begin with for various reasons, um, one of which is that I have tried to keep my daughter out of this medical uh, procedure that has been given to a lot of people for various reasons. And doing IVIG, it's a blood product. And so that could be a risk factor. There's also the risk factor that may not work. Um, so these treatments are about $40,000 per treatment with uh, without insurance. Our insurance company continues to deny us to this day. We're recording this here in September. So we've been trying since January. The head of neurology at the Children's Hospital said, yeah, she she needs uh, this immunotherapy, but our insurance company has continued to block us. We even dropped her off of our insurance plan so we could just use the state insurance because the state insurance said that they would cover it, but now they're not covering it, so... You know, um, good news is we started the Holy Hydrogen and we drink the water and she was doing inhalation about 90 minutes a day. And right away, she stopped having violent and aggressive behaviors. Now, it wasn't perfect. We went through a period during allergy season. We've, we've had some, quote unquote, flares that have been scary, um, but she has been able to sleep it off. A lot of it, she's, she'll, she'll have these periods where she'll just sleep and sleep and sleep and I just don't disturb her. Um, she never did that before. She would ne she would just kind of go manic and then wouldn't sleep. Uh, but now she's taking these long periods to sleep since we added the hydrogen. And we got to about June of this year and I had the interview with Dr. Tyler LeBaron about hydrogen and he actually uh, I told him about the success we were having with the holy hydrogen. And he's like, that's fascinating because the flow rate for inhalation on the holy hydrogen is not therapeutic, according to the research. And I was kind of floored because I've had so many people um, across the world get the holy hydrogen machine and have therapeutic results. Um, my code there, if you want to check it out, is Sarah K. Uh, but I've had reports of this, Greg, the hydrogen man, same thing reports of this. So I, I, he said, well, it's probably placebo. And I said, you can't placebo my daughter. <laughs> you, you can't, you can't placebo her for the most part. You really can't. Um, and with the, the, how she's been struggling with her health, like it's just not possible. Um, so he said, you know, if you wanted to take what she's doing and kick it up to the next level, you could try the Axiom machine. Now, it has six times the flow rate of the holy hydrogen. And so, of course, like I said, we're still having setbacks. It's not perfect. Life is a million times better than it was a year ago. A year ago, we had just gotten out of the ICU. She had been there for a week. Um, it was the most terrifying time of my life. And she was having these violent rage episodes to the point we were basically housebound. Like, we could not leave the house we couldn't go anywhere. My husband couldn't work. We couldn't do anything. I was having to send my son out of the house or leave the house with him. I was having to stay in hotels. I was having to stay with family members with the baby because it wasn't safe for him here. That was a year ago. So the holy hydrogen made it so that we could start living in our home as a family and my husband could start working again, like miraculous. Again, it hasn't been perfect. We've had a few setbacks here and there, but no violent behavior, you know, which is amazing. Uh, so I decided to invest in the Axiom H2. Again, I got a code there. If anyone wants to check that machine out, the code is Sarah K. Um, and again, saw, wow, for the first time in her life, she's not wetting the bed. I know that's like kind of 
personal information I'm putting out there, but that was a big issue where washing the sheets every single day stopped wetting the bed for the first time in her life. Um, and now we're in September when we typically flare, you know, because of pollen, different things growing, shift in light can be a huge trigger. And we're doing pretty darn good right now. Of course, we have occasional setbacks, right? Like a night where she doesn't sleep, um, which is hard. But overall, I'm super blown away with the H, the Axiom H2. We still have our holy hydrogen. We still use it, um, but I'm I'm really loving it. Again, the flow rate is six times higher, so it's got a lot of advantages to it. Um, so if you're you know wanting, if if I had to go back and do it again, I probably would start with the Axiom and just do that. But we love our holy hydrogen. It's a great machine, and not everyone's going to be able to get the price point of the Axiom machine. But I just want to give an update of where she's at. She continues to do better. And we're, we're having breakthroughs with her um, of things that I just thought was like going to be, this is like a lifelong issue. So it's slow. The progress is slow, but it's good. Um, and we're hitting critical mass here again with a season shift, a season change where we can typically have a lot of behaviors, um, allergies, and we're, we're doing good. So I know that was a lot to talk about here in the first part of the episode, but I got so many questions on that and I really appreciate people being so kind um, about it because it is hard to share your personal life in the public. So I appreciate that. All right, let's get to the questions. There are so many of them and I want to try to get to as many of them as I can. A lot of questions about water, hydrogen, structuring. Um, if you boil water or if you heat it, you destroy the structure. If you put water around non-native EMF, you destroy the structure. How do you know if your hydrogen machine is good, if it works? A lot of the time you want to get a meter. Uh, Axiom has a meter on their website. And my code there is Sarah K. Um, you can test it. You want to test the PPM uh, to make sure it's therapeutic level. So like above a 1.0 supposedly is therapeutic. The holy hydrogen measures at about a 1.6. The Axiom is a 2.0. You also got to make sure that you're not buying something where the heavy metals leach into the water because people will send me stuff all the time like, is this hydrogen bottle good? Is this hydrogen bottle good? It might measure therapeutic levels of hydrogen, but the, the membrane might be leaky. It might be leaking heavy metals into the water. So you have to be careful with those. Um, so that's all I'm going to say really about hydrogen, structuring water. You can get my hydration mastery course. Now, that is where I give a full explanation of how to test for hydrogen, how to test for structuring, but just a lot of questions on structuring and hydrogen. Test, get a little meter, see what is the therapeutic quality of that water, and then also how is it made. If it's cheap, it's probably going to not be as therapeutic. It's probably going to have some issues with heavy metals and contaminants. So just, just know that. You're going to get what you pay for a lot of the time. And with structuring, um, I really do like Veda Austin's freezing method to tell if your water is structured or not. That's a really good – it's very easy to do. You can get her uh, freezing technique. It's $30, I think, off of her website. If you want to know if something is structured, that's the best way to test it out because I get sent devices and stuff all the time. That's really the best way to test that out. And I go into that more in my um, hydration mastery course. All right. Let me look at some of these questions. I apologize for looking down. If you're watching on YouTube, I get, look at the camera, pay attention. I'm, I just want to read some of these questions. Uh, so how do we deal with mold in our home? We're renters, so we need to tread carefully. If you know there's a lot of mold and you're a renter, you can break your lease. A lot of the time you can get out of the lease. I just did an interview with um, Mike from Jasper, J-A-S-P-R. That episode will be out uh, sometime soon, I believe sometime in September. And he got into the mold business. And you know, from me talking about my daughter, some of the issues she was having were exacerbated by being, being at a school that she was in that had mold in it and they refused to remediate. So I didn't send her back. We kept her home for six months while she was recovering and having all these other health issues. But I think a lot of the seizure activities she was having started being triggered by being in a moldy school all day long. So if you can get out of a moldy 
environment, please do. But Jasper Air, um, again, he came on the podcast that should that might be out before this episode. I'm not sure what my um, my person who helps me produce the podcast is going to when he's going to put this out. But he said Jasper Air, he said they had a rental home, couldn't get out of the lease, couldn't get out of there, couldn't move. They cleaned it to the best of their ability, and then they set up the Jasper Air purifiers. I think an air doctor, really good air doctor, can also be helpful. Um, but making sure the home is as clean as possible and setting up air purifiers and then opening windows when possible, that's going to be your best bet. Um, if you can't get out of it, you want to keep those air purifiers going all the time. Um, and that's really the best thing you can do, but you can a lot of times get out of a lease or a rental with proof that there is mold legally. I'm pretty sure of that. Here's a question on wireless headphones and if they can use like shielding material or any kind of, um, mitigation for wired earbuds. I'm going to say no. I'm going to say you're going to want to avoid putting all Bluetooth on your body because we know that can really bring down your exclusion zone water and it can stop, uh, mitochondrial water production. It can interfere with that water production. So really try to eliminate Bluetooth sources from your body. If you have a laptop, turn the Bluetooth off. A lot of these smart homes, smart devices have Bluetooth. You can a lot of times turn the Bluetooth off. So Bluetooth is like the worst of the non-native EMF. That's why I think it's just so bad to have on your body. So wearing a shielding fabric or doing it, it just, just try to keep the Bluetooth off your body. Another question in this uh, little there's a set of questions, I'm just going to answer a couple out of them, is if I try to keep hydrogen water in a bottle for later in the day, can the hydrogen escape out of the bottle? Do I need to get a blue glass bottle? Can I put in a titanium bottle? Um, will metal change the water? Okay. And can I structure sparkling mineral water? You can make any water coherent. So yeah, you can make any water coherent. You could do that with an analemma wand. You could do that with intention. As far as hydrogen goes, it depends on how the hydrogen was made. I have done a lot of testing on different hydrogen and how long it stays stable in the glass. So it just depends on how the hydrogen was made. When I actually bought a little hydrogen bottle and tested it, um, and the hydrogen pretty much disappeared as soon, like within a couple of minutes of me exposing that water to air. When I make hydrogen with the holy hydrogen, it stays stable in a glass as long as I don't shake it, the air can hit it, all of that for about six hours. With the axiom, same thing as long as I don't shake it, expose it to a bunch of stuff, it stays stable for 24 hours. With the spring aqua, which is something I have under sink, that stays stable for probably about 12 hours. So it depends on how the hydrogen was made. Um, Axiom sends you a bottle that's kind of like a Yeti, the Yeti material, and you can screw the top on and that actually will stay good. It stayed good the whole time I went to Texas to be on Alex Zex podcast. Um, I was gone for 48 hours. <laughs> And when I came back, I opened up the cap from the Axiom and it still had therapeutic level of hydrogen in it. So everything is context dependent. How is it made? You know, glass, titanium, it doesn't necessarily matter. It's just like, are you shaking it up? Are you exposing it to a lot of non-native EMF? Um, that is all dependent. A little weird thing that I will tell you, I will make a big thing of hydrogen. I use my Axiom to make a big thing of hydrogen water for the family. I do Quinton. I do Dr. Dean's Minerals. I do like a whole little mixture for everybody. And I will leave it downstairs and I'll cover it with like a, a little towel or something. In the morning, I test it. It's therapeutic and we all drink it, right? I'll make a bit, like two gallons of it every night before bed and um, leave it sitting out there covered. I will take, I will pour a glass out of that and place it beside my bed um, at night in case I'm thirsty in the night or something like that. I test that same glass of water that's been beside my bed and my room doesn't have a ton of EMF. I've measured, I've had a specialist out, um, but in the morning I'll test it and the hydrogen has gone down to the point where it's not therapeutic. So I don't know if my, um, I'm emitting something in my sleep. I don't know what's going on. It's very interesting. So all kinds of things can impact the hydrogen, the structuring, you know, maybe again, maybe I'm emitting, I don't know. There's a little bit woo here. 
So let's see. My amber blue blocking glasses have a blue sheen when light hits it. Is this typical of amber blue blockers? I haven't seen that before, to be honest with you. But if you want to make sure that your blue blockers are blocking what they say they block, um, then you want to use a spectrometer to measure. Uh, Spectra 479 is an inexpensive pair from Amazon that I recommend. Uh, Raw Optics, my code there is Sarah. And then Viva Rays, they're a podcast sponsor. Podca- uh, co- code there is Yogi. Those are ones I have personally tested. I've also heard Bon Charge. I think my code there is Sarah K now. Um, they, their glasses are good. Block Blue Light, I have not tested those, but I've heard those are good. I'm trying to think of some other brands. I think Midwestern Red Light Therapy, again, haven't tested those, but I've heard those are good. EMR Tech has some blue blocking blo- glasses. Um, I've heard that those are good. So you got to test it to know. I haven't seen the blue sheen, but uh, what additives can you put in hydrogen water without neutralizing the effect of hydrogen? I have found that if I add electrolytes, salt, magnesium, and trace mineral drops and apple cider vinegar to my water, I can decrease the frequency of migraines from 20 days to two days a month. Oh yeah, there's definitely something to uh, minerals and migraines for sure. Do any of these decrease the effectiveness of the hydrogen water? If it's okay to add them, should they be added before? Uh, making the water into hydrogen water. I use both hydrogen stick and hydrogen water bottle if that matters. So it again, depends on the way you're making the hydrogen. With the Axiom, um, you test, you got to get a meter to test it. And I did this after the episode I did with Dr. Tyler LeBaron. I had, because in the episode I did with Dr. LeBaron, he was talking about the Kangen machine and how the Kangen machine if you don't keep the electrodes super, super clean, it stops making hydrogen water. So all you have is alkaline water with a negative ORP, and that can be very dangerous to drink and cause a lot of tissue damage, gut issues. Not a good idea. You want the water to have a negative ORP due to the hydrogen, okay? So uh, that's why it's important to test. So I did some testing with Quinton, with salt, with adding things to the water and uh, with the holy hydrogen. So the holy hydrogen, you don't want to put anything in that canister because it will mess with the electrodes. With the axiom though, you can have, it's like a wand that goes into, you know, I'll do like two gallons of water and it will fully saturate the water within like 15 minutes, which is pretty cool. And it'll fully saturate about a liter of water in three minutes. So I put all my minerals and everything in the water, and then I will put the wand in there and saturate the water. But I test. I test to make sure Um, because it's all machine dependent. With the water bottles, I don't know because like I said, when I have tested these water bottles, uh, which can be, you know, they can have leaky membranes and such, as soon as the air hits, hits that water, the hydrogen goes. With the Axiom, I could add my Quinton. I could add Dr. Dean's minerals. I could add all kinds of stuff. Uh, Pop the wand in there. It's fully saturated and it's good to go. That's typically what I do for the family. With the holy hydrogen, you make the distilled water in the canister, pour it in the glass. You can add minerals, um, you know, add all of that stuff. And it's still fully saturated at a therapeutic level. So I think it depends on the machine. And then if you probably like add too much, like if you're just like pouring, pouring, pouring um, apple cider vinegar in there, which I wouldn't necessarily recommend doing, you could probably dilute the therapeutic uh, benefits of the water as well. So test, test it out and see. Today's show is brought to you by Upgraded Formulas. They have my absolute favorite magnesium. You can get the best and only clinically studied stabilized nano magnesium supplement on the market from Upgraded Formulas using my code YOGI for 10% off. Did you know that magnesium is actually required for over 800 enzymatic reactions in the body? This clinically studied magnesium has proven to improve sleep quality and energy by over 60%, specifically improving light sleep measurement by 90%, REM sleep by 150%, and deep sleep by 250%. That means more energy, better mood, and deeper sleep. Who doesn't want that? What makes this the best on the market? This specific magnesium is nano magnesium, which means it is easier for your body to absorb and use. In fact, it is absorbed up to 99.99%, which means you'll feel the results instantaneously. 
A lot of people are quick to talk about the benefits of sunlight, but what gets often missed in the conversation is the benefit of darkness and the importance of protecting yourself from blue and green light after sunset. That is why I choose Viva Rays as my go-to source for protecting my circadian rhythms. You can use the code YOGI to save 15% off at Viva Rays. Now, you may have seen some of these studies popping up. I call them fear mongering about blue blockers not being effective. And that is a partial truth because when you use blue blockers that are clear or that have not been tested with a spectrometer to actually block what they say they do, they will not protect your circadian rhythms and they are not catching those key wavelengths that you need to be blocking in order for your body to be able to repair for you to make melatonin, which is a master antioxidant. And artificial light at night has been in the scientific literature extensively linked to a host of hormonal cancers, obesity, diabetes, and all sorts of metabolic issues. That again is why I choose Viva Rays as my go-to source for protecting my circadian rhythms to allow my body to get adequate darkness at night. You can use the code YOGI to save 15% over at Viva Rays, and you can actually trust that they block the frequencies of light that they say they do. Thanks to Viva Rays for sponsoring today's podcast. In the later stages of healing from leptin resistance, is it normal to still have the odd day here and there where satiety signals are a bit off despite doing everything right, following circadian practices and quantum nutrition? I mean, I think, yeah, our bodies can go through ebbs and flows due to stress. Um, And this is something I have just basically redone my entire 21-day leptin reset program. Like every single lesson has been redone because I've learned so much since I originally put the program out in 2022. Um, I learned so much. And so I have just redone that whole entire program. So if you have it, go back and redo it. Um, Or if you're thinking about doing it, know that it is my best, most updated information. But the thing is that we want to be resilient. So we're going to have an off day due to stress. And this is one thing I emphasize a lot in my 21 day program is that, you know, you're going to come up against stress. Things are going to happen, but you want your body. It's just an odd day. Something that you have something going on in your life and you got to be cognizant of it, like a bad night of sleep. Um, and you can recover from it and you know, not to add more stressors on that day. Or if you're like, didn't sleep and you have a bunch of cravings one day, maybe you're like, I'm not going to necessarily give into these cravings. I'm going to take it easy. And so, yeah. It can happen. It can definitely happen. Just having an off day, it's typically going to be due to stress. Okay. So how do you navigate incorporating circadian strategies while also being on pharmaceuticals? I've been very consistent with implementing everything taught here that has made my SSRI and testosterone bioidentical cream work too well. I started to feel high by the afternoon. It was a real issue. With my doctor's direction, I'm starting to wean down on both, but I'm nervous about the winter and not having the sun to buffer the difference of my new lower medications. How have others made this transition? Thank you. Um, So again, this is really important to monitor things with your doctor because I'll have people to do my 21-day program to implement this stuff. And all of a sudden, they have hyperthyroid symptoms. They're like, oh my gosh, I'm just like, my, I am have insomnia. I have all this extra energy. I have anxiety. Like what's going on? I'm like, go get a blood test from your doctor. You might need to cut, bring down your medications. And so this is just something you continue to monitor. Yes, our thyroid levels and our hormone levels do shift during winter time. So I would just continue to monitor that with your doctor um, to see. And I'm just like so excited about this uh, this question, because I mean, it's just a testament. I've had so many people that do this work, either they do my free content because I try to put out a lot of free stuff or they do the, my 21 day program, which is really inexpensive for what you get. Honestly, it's, it's like very inexpensive for what you get, but they do it and they come down or they come off of medication. And it's, it's so important to work with your doctor on this. Um, but Yeah. I think you just keep working with your doctor and you just pay attention. You just listen to your body. That's the beautiful thing about these um, practices, the circadian practices is that you get to be more in touch with your body and the natural signals. And it's a beautiful thing. It builds resilience. 
uh, mental fortitude. It's just, it's just a beautiful thing. So keep going. I'm so excited by this question. Um, and just keep monitoring with your doctor. You'll, you'll kind of know, you'll, you'll kind of know like, okay, um, there is a shift that happens in the winter time with hormones, thyroid, all of that, but hopefully you're building up this resilience and this connection. And you can implement a lot of the things I talk about. I did an episode called the do's and don'ts of shifting into winter. That's going to give you a lot of great information about how to make this seasonal shift. Um, and I go over that deeper in my 21 day program, but do those things. And it may not be as much of an issue because it's only a, it's only like a, a slight shift. It's not super dramatic. Um, what if you are plagued by stress this time of year and you're waking up at three or 4 AM unable to get back to sleep? I don't want my body to adapt to this habit. I'm trying to go to bed early, but I've got a bad cough and that wakes me up in the night. I'm still trying to get morning sunlight and evening sunset. Also is it still beneficial if you have contacts to go outside for light? I can't keep taking them out each time I go outside, but I want to make a difference. Okay. So a couple things, if you have a cough and it's waking you up, um, that hopefully is going to pass and not continue. But if you wake up way earlier than you want to wake up, then you just want to do a couple things. You don't want to turn on a bunch of lights. You want to keep it very restorative. This is a time if I wake up, I will pray. I will meditate. I will try to do something super restorative, keep stimulation low. I'm not going to eat anything because those are zeitgeibers, right? The main zeitgeiber is light and that's a timekeeper. And then you've got um, food and temperature. So keep those things like as low key as you can. And don't st- try not to stress about it. I know easier said than done, but our intention and our mood and all that stuff can really impact our body as well. Um, as far as the contacts go, I would look into getting Daly's brand. Again, not medical advice, but that's the only brand I know of that doesn't block UV light. Of course, there's going to be a blocking of some of the oxygen flow in the eye, which could also be an issue. But um, I would look into that. And if there was a time that I was not going to wear contacts, it would be the morning. I would try to get sunrise light and UVA light both um, in my eyes before I put the contacts in for the day. If that's possible for you as we move into winter, it might be harder and harder. Um, But I would try to get some of the natural light before putting contacts in. So prioritize the morning light. And during the day, I would look into something like dailies that doesn't block UV light. Can sunlight come through screens properly? It blocks about 5 to 10%. So obviously gold standard is going to be no screen. But I'll sit in on my screened in porch um, during the summer when we have a lot of mosquitoes and bugs. Or if it's raining, I'll do that. I do try to go outside in my backyard with my dog in the mornings and do some grounding and let her go out there, go to the bathroom, do what she needs to do, and then go sit behind the screen but it's like a five to 10% blockage. I don't think it's a huge, huge deal, but if you want to go gold standard, obviously you're going to take the screens out of your windows, but bugs and all kinds of stuff can get in. So, um, let's see if your sleep is thrown off for many nights in a row and it isn't possible to go bed earlier. think babies and kids, is it okay to sleep in for a number of days or what is the best way to handle sleep deprivation? And what about naps, timing, are they okay, length, et cetera? So ideally, if you're going to take a nap, I always tell people to take it um, towards the middle part of the day or early afternoon. Try not to nap after 3 p.m. And I try not to go over 45 minutes. But if you're somebody dealing with like a chronic illness, um, I'm going to tell people to try to get morning light, even if you have to like move your bed over to a window. Uh, and just have the window open during sunrise and UVA time just to give your body that really strong signal and rest. With babies and small kids, I get it. Because like I mentioned in the beginning of the episode, my daughter will still have the odd night like she did this week where she was up at like three o'clock and then at four o'clock and then at five o'clock. And then it's like, oh my God, like I can't. (laughs) <laughs> at the four o'clock wake up, I was just up for the day and it gave me a really bad headache and I just didn't feel good the whole day, you know? So that morning I didn't get out until UVA. Um, and I didn't stress out about it. I just tried to go outside as much as I could. I drank a lot of minerals, my Canton. I drank a lot of hydrogen water. I did some inhalation. I did some grounding. You just try to do all the things that you can that are no, that you know are healthy and helpful. And think about small kids and babies. It's a really small time period. I think there was another question about how to handle this lifestyle with babies and children. And the thing is, you do your best. 
you control what you can control. So you don't scroll on your phone if you wake up in the night. That's a big one that people will do. Even if your phone screen's on red and you're wearing blue blockers, you're stimulating brain waves that should not be stimulated at nighttime. You're going into beta and you don't want to do that at nighttime. You don't want to do that early in the morning. You don't want to do that before bed because this is also going to impact dopamine, cortisol, adrenaline, all of these things as well, um, which they're neurotransmitters that we, we need to just be at a lower level at certain points of the day. So if you've got babies and small kids that wake you up in the night, try to use circadian friendly lighting, um, either like a red light bulb, or I use the little amber clip on lights as like flashlights. I use those around my son's room and beside my bed when we're nursing and doing all those things. And don't stare at your phone. Don't scroll. Even if you're wearing blue blockers and a red phone screen, have downtime, have away time from your phone. And that's one thing I definitely did not do everything perfectly with my son for sure. But that's one thing that I was really strict about is like 8 PM phone goes away. If I'm nursing, phone goes away. I don't want to have the phone near the baby. That's a lot of non-native EMF for developing brain and body to deal with. Blue blockers. If I wake up, the HUGA clip on light, all of those things are really, really helpful. So I hope that helps. Um, are we still getting benefits of sunrise and sunset if we don't have a clear view of both, but are outside? Yes. Just go outside. It's okay if there's things in the way and blocking. Um, I'm currently pregnant with my first child. I'm excited, but I'm saddened with the quality, with the quality, mm, lack of quality dietary advice. Eat lots of this. Don't eat any of that. They're all focused on an insane amount of whole grains or processed foods. How do you recommend pregnant women to eat, especially as it relates to seasonally? And somebody here said Weston A. Price. I would definitely, I love Weston A. Price. They also have a nourishing um, a book about children and how to feed children. I think that's really, really helpful. Um, as far as seasonality goes in pregnancy, like here's the thing about first trimester. A lot of women don't feel good. And I've, I've seen people in these like mitochondriac groups be like, oh, and it's like always it's not okay. I have male listeners. So know that I love you all, everyone. But it's a lot of men that have never had a baby before telling women that because they have nausea, that they have low redox and there's something wrong with you and you just, it's your fault. So that's not really a good thing to tell a pregnant woman. And I don't know how much of a hundred percent truth that is. Um, so you got to do your best in that first trimester. I have a lot of women that come to my leptin program and they get pregnant. A lot of them are trying to get pregnant. And then sometimes like I have a woman who I think she's like 43 right now and she's pregnant with her second, um, having a really great pregnancy. So I do have a lot of pregnant women in my community. They did the leptin reset and got pregnant. Um, but first trimester can be kind of a crapshoot, you know, like I had a lot of cravings for potatoes and tomatoes and like all these really high potassium rich foods. And they were not in season at the time I was having these cravings, but you know what? My body was low on these nutrients. And so I didn't, and I was like, I had been carnivore keto for a long period of time, but now I'm dreaming of potatoes and tomatoes and all these, like I said, high potassium foods. Um, so my body needed that. And so I think if it's a whole food, it's typically all right. Um, you want to prioritize protein in pregnancy. I think animal protein is very important in pregnancy. DHA, I love salmon roe. Uh, during pregnancy, very important. Those are those are some crucial nutrients that I think pregnant women and babies need. Like my son started basically talking at five weeks old, not like talking obviously, but like babbling, like like this baby is talking to me. And I had a spoonful of salmon roe probably five days a week through my whole pregnancy. I gagged it down during first trimester, um, and I prioritize animal protein. So do your best, but I think prioritizing animal protein, getting in. It's a natural source of DHA EPA for brain development of the baby. Minerals, Keenton, um, has water and wellness, has a pregnancy protocol. I have that in my 21-day program, but you can go on their website. I think your minerals are very important because a lot of women end up with dental issues because the baby takes the, your minerals and adequate vitamin D levels. I did a lot of sun exposure 
um, before pregnancy, really tried to get my stores up. I didn't supplement. That was a personal choice. But those are basics I think that can be helpful for nutrition for pregnancy. Um, yeah. So that's what I think. And can we o- over add minerals in the water? I use an Aqua True RO and trace minerals plus Soleil water in each glass. I don't drink. I don't measure it. Can it be a problem? I don't measure my minerals anymore either. And honestly, you, you tip it and trace minerals. I don't love those. I've, I've had some people have some negative, um, effects with trace minerals. So I, what I do typically is a splash of Quinton and I'll use Dr. Dean's Remag. Uh, I think my code at Dr. Dean's is Sarah K. And I do that for the family. Um, usually if you overdo minerals, you're going to, your body's going to excrete it. You're going to get rid of it. You're going to have like loose stools. I'll have this a lot in, uh, in my group. If people are overdoing the minerals, a lot of times you're going to have loose stools. Um, or excess urination that can mean that you're doing too much of the sodium, too much of the salt. Um, so those are some ways to tell you could have a little bit of swelling if you're overdoing it. I tip, again, I don't measure, I kind of go by resonance, which I know sounds a little bit woo woo, but yeah, I don't measure. So you may want to start off measuring and then back off and see how you feel. But typically if you overdo it, it's going to come out. Again, this is not medical advice. None of this podcast is medical advice. And sometimes it can be really helpful to work one-on-one. I know my friend, Dr. Sarah Pugh is doing HTMAs right now. She's really diving into the HTMA rabbit hole and she can read these from the quantum perspective and tell you if you're getting too much blue light, too much non-native EMF, look nutritionally what you might need to change because we should really get a lot of minerals from our food as well. So that's, that's really important. Okay. I've been getting out in the morning light and UVA light consistently for almost five and a half months. I found after a couple of months that I have high testosterone levels, wondering how I can support that. My hormones are non-existent and I'm postmenopausal for almost two years. I'm on a few supplements and also have Hashimoto's that's been diagnosed. Um, that's like kind of a loaded question because I'm wondering like what supplements are you on? Cause sometimes supplements like maca can cause testosterone levels to go up. What do the other hormones look like? Um, are you having negative impact from the high testosterone? So there's a lot of that nutrition and food timing, meal timing also plays a role in hormone balance and, 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 uh, micronutrients, macronutrients also play a role in hormone balance, getting enough adequate bioavailable protein, getting up enough essential minerals, trace minerals. Those are also important with hormones as well. Um, having enough cholesterol in your diet. So yeah, I would probably talk with someone one-to-one and then look at supplements that you're taking with Hashimoto's. I always recommend kind of an autoimmune type of a protocol, um, as far as your diet goes, uh, good job with the light, continue doing that and making sure you're blocking blue light at night as well. That can also alter hormone levels, believe it or not, if you're not blocking blue light at night. So, um, if you're like, yeah, right. Then Google for me, hormonal cancer and artificial light at night and have fun reading like lots and lots and lots of studies and Google will still show it as of now. (laughs) Okay. Um, looking at the rising sun with my glasses off after having cataract surgery and getting new artificial lens, I'm wondering if these block UV and infrared light. I can't find any information on my own about this. The answer is probably, but here's the other answer. We have photoreceptors on our skin. And I actually just created a whole new module in my leptin reset about this because it's a question I get. I've had LASIK, I have cataracts, you know, it's different than having contacts you can take in and out, glasses you can take on and off. You literally have a mechanism now that's going to just be there. You can't go back and undo a surgery. I'm not going to sit here and freak people out because they have a surgery they can't undo right? You can't put a body part back. You can't undo one of these surgeries. So what I do tell people is that your brain has ways of adapting. You have photoreceptors on the skin. You can get signaling through skin as well. And your body, your brain, I think will adapt. So continue doing all these practices. Continue with uh, blocking blue light at night. And don't stress about the fact that you've had a LASIK or or cataract. I know I, I might 
ruffle some feathers in this space with that one. But like, literally, what are you going to do? You can't undo the surgery. And I truly believe after looking at all the research with the photoreceptors on the skin, that there's your brain and your body will adapt and that you, you're still going to get tremendous benefits from being outdoors. So don't let it be a stumbling block or something that keeps you up at night. Please don't. And, and keep doing this. Um, does light, I get this a lot. Does light coming through the sides of blue blockers matter? It seems pointless to wear when I get glimpses of the normal light. When I look off to the side, it's what comes in directly through the retina. That is the most, uh, of a signal for your brain. And so I know that Dave Asprey's company, true dark at one point, cause I had them, they have the blue blockers that have like foam around the side. So if you really feel like it impacts you, you can get those, but God, those are really uncomfortable. And like, you're going to you don't realize how much you use your peripheral vision to sense your environment until you try to wear a pair of those and it's a disaster. So um, I think someone should make a video of somebody trying to get around in, in those glasses. It's like not pretty. So you can get those. I think True Dark is where I got mine, but I it was like 10 years ago that I bought them. Um, but it's really what comes in through the retina. So if you have to go somewhere where there's like a ton of overhead lights, wear a baseball cap. Um, and it's after sunset, I would wear a baseball cap and the blue blockers, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't, um, stress about it too much. Where can we find the best deuterium depletion protocol for general wellness? I would say the light water website, L I T E W A T E R. I know my friend, Dr. Sarah is an affiliate for them and her code is Dr. Sarah. Sarah has no H on it. And I think they have like a whole, um, chart of how to deplete your water, how to do a depletion, all of that. That's where I would start. Um, and Dr. Gabor Somalier, I think he has depletion protocols in his books. And I think uh, Dr. Petra, who I had on the podcast recently, if you wanted to work with a doctor to actually do a protocol with you, if you had, if I had cancer, I would be um, a patient of Dr. Petra's. Absolutely. Um, so those are some resources for you to look at Dr. Somalier's books. And if you want someone to work with you one-on-one -on -one to give you specialized protocols, Dr. Petra would be one or the Lightwater website. Hope that helps. Do you have any insight as to why I might always feel cold, especially hands and feet? I'm from Finland and love sauna and ice swimming, so I don't understand what is going on and how to overcome this. I mean, it could be a thyroid issue that can cause cold hands and feet and we have this whole thing where we think more is better. So you might be overdoing sauna and cold because they are stressors. So your body is always going to try to bring you back into balance. That's a beautiful thing about our bodies is they're always trying to bring us back into balance and back into rhythm. And so if you're adding too many stressors and it might not even be the cold and the sauna, but you might have like something really crazy going on in your personal life that could be creating an imbalance with the thyroid, with your leptin. Typically a leptin goes low, thyroid goes low, or leptin goes way high, you become leptin resistant, there's thyroid issues. There's always an interlink with thyroid and leptin. Um, and then also I know if you're living in Finland, the light is different and you do have to be more uh, kind of on top of things with your circadian rhythms. And so that might also be something to look at is what other stressors are you going through? But if your hands and feet are cold all the time, and that could also be circulation issues, it could be so many things. Like it's so hard for me to give an answer. That's one thing where I would say you might want to get a consultation with somebody. Um, I know Dr. Sarah is doing consults again. She might kick my butt for <laughs> saying this on my podcast because her email will explode. Uh, Kiara Lee Wellness. I know she's doing some consultation. She's been on the podcast before. Uh, Dr. Max Gulhane, I believe he's still doing one-to-one. -one. So there's a good amount of quantum practice. I know Carrie B is still doing some limited consultations. So there's a good amount of quantum practitioners that will reach out to to understand this stuff. Dr. Sarah is really, uh, Dr. Sarah and Carrie, I would say can read labs better than anybody else that I know of. And Sarah's doing now the HTMA. So that it could be something to look at. Um, this may be a silly question, but if you pour structured water into unstructured water, does it become unstructured? Uh, I have heard that it actually can make the rest of the water coherent. But again, this is one of those things you might want to just like test it out to see. Water is very interesting. Water is alive. Um, I love 
I love studying water, looking at how water behaves. And so it, it all depends. Honestly, I think it all depends. You could just test it, learn Veda's freezing technique and maybe freeze the water after it's been mixed to see what it looks like. Freeze it when it's structured, see what it looks like, and then mix it and see what it looks like. That, that would be um, something simple and easy that you could do to see. Okay. Uh, wondering about UVA light. I know it appears when the sun is at 10 to 30 degrees, about one to three hours after sunrise. Does it go away when UVB appears and then appear again before sunset? Or is it there all day when UVB is also present? It is there all day long. UVA is available all year long. And I have a new YouTube channel called My Circadian App. I have an app that's coming out really soon. My private community is beta testing it right now. But it basically tells you um, daybreak, sunrise, UVA, UVB, sunset, nightfall. When that happens for you, it picks up your location. It has a little solar callus timer so you can gauge your time in the sun. It's similar to D-Minder, but we're not going to necessarily tell you how much vitamin D you make because it's not accurate. I'm going to have Jim Stevenson Jr. back on the show again soon to talk about why that is. And your, vi- your body's using the vitamin D that you're making and absorbing. So I have a whole informational section about that on my circadian app. And I have informational videos on the my circadian app YouTube channel. If you haven't been there yet, it's just all one word, my circadian app. I'm going to break down daybreak. Should you go outside during daybreak? Why or why not? Uh, morning UVA versus all day long UVA, because in the summertime, uh, unless you live in a place where there's no sun during the winter, like Alaska, like a couple of days, there's like a, like night for a couple of days. It's wild, but there are places on the world where they have like a night, like no sun for a couple of days, like during the winter solstice. So when I say there's UVA all day long, um, for most people, I have to exclude those people, but in the winter, UVA available all day long. In the summer, UVA available all day long, but you get the layering on of UVB in more of the middle of the day. And my app is going to show you all of that. And also we'll have a Lux meter because Lux is a whole interesting topic. I'll have education about that on the website, a moon tracker and a compass, because ideally when you go outside in the morning, you want to face east. And then for sunset, you want to face west. And it's really crazy when you haven't been doing these practices. A lot of people don't have a sense of direction where is north, south, east, and west? I would actually, that was me um, probably about five years ago. Now I can kind of see my way around. I can look up and say, oh, that's west. That's, you know, so the app will have all that for you. So stay tuned. Go to the My Circadian app. Um, I have an Instagram page now and I have a YouTube channel. But yes, UVA light is available for most places, unless you're one of those places where there's a night for a couple of days um, all day long. Okay. Let's see. Um, I've been a follower for a while now. Thank you for being here. I'm wondering if you discuss how your leptin research strategies impact lipedema. So lipedema is a, I think it's a, it's an, a hormonal condition and it can be heavily, uh, associated with estrogen dominance. And so in the leptin reset program, the leptin reset program is going to help you with hormone balancing, whether you're in reproductive age, like I said, I've had in the earlier in the show, I've had several women come do the program and get pregnant after multiple failed attempts. Um, I've had women in their forties that weren't trying to get pregnant, get pregnant in their mid forties. And I think the oldest woman that I've had do the leptin reset is 47 and she's about to have a baby, healthy baby. Um, so yeah, it helps to balance hormones. I also have a lot of women in menopause that have had to come down off of HRT, lessen their dose, or they come off of it entirely. I'm not against it. I'm not going to be for or against it on the show. I don't prescribe it. But what I've seen with lipidemia, lipedema, and I was actually diagnosed with lipedema when I was doing carnivore and I had a lot of painful fat on my legs, like it was painful doing the circadian practices, doing all the things with light and the things with food, doing a little ketosis, doing sometimes a little bit of fasting can be tremendously helpful with lipedema. 
So just know that the leptin reset is going to help address some hormone imbalances and can also help you to reduce your toxic load and reduce deuterium. I think that there's a link with high deuterium levels and lipedema as well. And so a leptin reset is going to help you naturally deplete deuterium and it's going to help you to normalize hormone levels. Again, not medical advice, but I have had a lot of women that have done a lot of keto carnivore and fasting come to the 21 day program and have success at lipedema. Mine has been completely reversed. Like I do not have any painful fat on my legs. My legs are the leanest they've ever been. They're not perfect. I do, you know, from losing a hundred pounds three times and being pregnant four times and, you know, all the stuff I put my body through, I have imperfections, loose skin, all of that. Right. But this has been tremendous. And I didn't have like stage four, I didn't have severe lipedema, but it was very helpful and I don't have that diagnosis anymore. So, um, yes, it can be very, very helpful. Strategies to heal abnormal uterine bleeding due to fibroids. So a leptin reset, I know I sound like a broken record, but you want to bring down inflammation, fibroids, Here's the thing that I think gets lost and I get emails. I have someone that helps me with my emails. Thank you, Amanda. You are a saint because <laughs> we get a lot of emails and she will often message me about specific things and I try to help her get through them. Um, but when you have, it doesn't matter. Do you have endometriosis? I had adenomyosis and I had painful fibroids that I had removed when I was in my mid thirties and I had Hashimoto's, I had a lot of autoimmune stuff going on. Um, and I don't even like the word autoimmune. I don't like to think that my body is attacking me. I think that the body is responding to the environment. The body is responding to the inputs that you're getting it. Is it blue light? Is it um, non native EMF? Is it food, confusing food signals? Are you eating too much at the wrong times of day? Are you, what kind of water are you drinking? What kind of air are you breathing? What kind of chemicals are you putting on your skin? All of these things are going to impact the mitochondria and the way that your mitochondria are moving energy, making water, making ATP. And so what I think a lot of people don't understand is that genetics become, they, they are expressed when mitochondria become dysfunctional. And I think it's Dr. Doug, I know it's Dr. Doug Wallace. I believe the number he gives is about 70%. So when you have about 70% mitochondrial dysfunction, that's when you can start to see whatever genetic predispositions that you have begin to be expressed. For some people, that might be diabetes. For some people, that might be Alzheimer's, For some, which I think is a form of diabetes. Um, for some people, that might be endometriosis. For some people like me, it was adenomyosis. Um, might be fibroids. Fibroids, growths, these things can be due to lack of exclusion zone water and poor mitochondrial function, poor redox function. These things really overlap one another because the job of the mitochondria is to make this water for the body. And so if I, when I had fibroids, what I did, and they never came back, I had a surgery and my doctor said, these are going to come back. You're going to be back here probably in a year to get another surgery. They were so painful. I looked like I was pregnant all the time. And so we did a surgery to cut all of them out. I don't know that I would do that again, knowing what I know now. Um, but she said, they're going to come back. What did I do? I went totally non-toxic. This was before I even found carnivore, before I found like anything that I do now, really. Uh, but we didn't have the same kind of issues with non-native EMF back then. We didn't have the same kind of issues with the Wi-Fi and all that. Like it was a, it was kind of, it was different, right? Um, and so I just basically went paleo. And I said, if it's not a whole food, I'm not eating it. If it comes in a box or a package or it's processed or it's a bar, I'm not going to eat it. And as long as I stuck to that protocol, I didn't get fibroids. They didn't come back. They never came back. Um, and so if I had uh, uterine bleeding fibroids, I would do a leptin reset. I would look at an autoimmune um, style of eating. You could look at autoimmune paleo, or I've got some autoimmune uh, recommendations in my leptin reset program. I might look at castor oil packs, but I'll be really gentle with those because that can really get things stirred up and going. And you have to be careful now about mentioning castor oil, apparently on the internet. I love castor I love castor oil. I think it's fabulous, um, but you have to be careful with it as well, because it can also, uh, 
cause hormones to shift. Like for instance, castor oil can induce labor. And so you think it can really cause hormones to shift. So I've seen people do too much castor oil and have symptoms of low estrogen, like dry eyes. And so you got to be careful. And I'm somebody with castor oil that if I do, it's so consistent across the board. If I do castor oil packs in the last half of my cycle, it'll make my cycle come early, like five days early. Every single time it does it. And I'm like, oh, why did I get my cycle five days early? Oh, because I did castor oil packs after ovulation every single time. So some people are going to be more sensitive to it. So those are some things to look into. Again, not medical advice, but something to just look into. Um, suggestion for the appearance of hyperpigmentation or melasma as we get older. Look at your blue light exposure. More time in the morning sunlight, the evening sunlight. Be care- Wear a hat in um, UVA. Just kind of protect that until you get your exposure down. And then also look at your minerals. Minerals can play a part. I actually had some hyperpigmentation on my cheek. I, I, I saw it in some photos. I was holding my son after my son was born. I was like, oh my God, what is that? And believe it or not, when we started, we installed the Spring Aqua system, um, which has hydrogen structured mineral water. When we installed that, it, it started fading. But when I started doing, um, the holy hydrogen and hydrogen inhalation, just with the holy hydrogen, not even with the axiom. I think the axiom probably would have zapped it quicker, but doing the hydrogen with the holy hydrogen completely zapped my hyperpigmentation, totally gone, totally reversed it. Same thing with my husband, because I put my husband on hydrogen every night. He actually breathes the holy hydrogen in still, um, because I don't like to carry the axiom up and down the stairs. And so he, I took the holy hydrogen and put it beside his bed and he breathes it in and then he'll unplug it to sleep for the night, but he'll just lay in bed at night and breathe in the holy hydrogen. He loves it. Um, and his, he had a couple, he had a couple, same thing. Like, so some must've been something in our food, our environment, um, non-native EMF that was causing a, the hyperpigmentation, uh, but now it's gone. So look at increase, you know, supporting mitochondrial function. That's what hydrogen does is it, it basically supports mitochondrial function. I know it sounds way too simple, but it works. So, um, here we go. I hope all is okay with your family. Thank you. You talk a lot about meal timing. I can't find any reference to when to eat breakfast. I think you say sunlight first and then breakfast. Is it better to eat within a certain time period of getting up? So I answered this on my uh, do's and don'ts of winter because it's going to shift and it's going to depend on your stress levels. It's going to depend on the time of year. It's going to depend on your goals. I like people to stabilize the blood sugar uh, in the morning. So if the sun's not rising till eight o'clock in the morning, I will say eat something when you wake up, if you have to be out the door. Now I have the luxury of a lot of the time sun, the latest that's going to come up here is eight. So my kids and I tend to sleep in a little bit more in the winter time, and I'll still try to eat the breakfast around sunrise time. So it all depends on time of year, your goals, your schedule. Like, let's just give an example. I get a lot. If you have to be out the door for work at 6 30 in the morning, I'm going to say eat before you leave, take the time stabilize your blood sugar and eat. And maybe the sun doesn't come up till eight o'clock in the morning, but the food, you've got to be up anyway. Food is a zeitgeber. It's a secondary timekeeper and it's going to help so that your adrenals don't come in and try to save the day. So that's just uh, something to understand. I would like to know more about pregnenolone steel and if morning coffee with or without morning sunlight can increase cortisol to the point where pregnenolone is shunted down cortisol and away from sex steroid hormones. It's all like, so in the morning, uh, we make pregnenolone and that is gone. It goes to cortisol pathway and the sex steroid hormone pathway. It's all about perceived sense of safety. So I have a couple of friends of mine that are like super quantum, but they live in the jungle right? They live off grid. They don't have a normal stressful life. They can make their own schedule, right? 
And they are like, I drink coffee on an empty stomach every day. Look at me. I'm doing it. And I'm like, yeah, but you're barefoot outside in the sun. You don't have kids. You don't have a job you have to run off to. You don't have a non-native EMF all around you in blue light. So it's all dependent on your environment. Um, you know, there's a lot of people who are like, oh, coffee doesn't cause a rise in cortisol. Well, it might not for that person I just mentioned. But I don't know what kind of stress you have going on your in your life, whether or not it's going to um, bring up your cortisol and adrenaline. It's all about your level of hormone balance now. What does your cortisol patterns look like now? Um, what is your perceived level of stress? What is your blood sugar balance like? What's the you know what's the state of your health? How what's the state of your mitochondria? All of that are, is going to play a role in whether about you're not your body feels safe if your body feels safe it's going to make that appropriate amount of cortisol and send pregnenolone down the sex steroid hormone pathway if it feels safe and it feels good and a cup of coffee may not impact that but it might for some people if you have caffeine sensitivity so i know that's not a straightforward here's a protocol <laughs> here's a here's a 10 step process and a five reasons to do this and not to do that like the viral youtube kind of information. I know it's not that, but it's just, it's all dependent on your lifestyle and all these other states that you're currently in or not in. I know. I hope that helps. Uh, managing health in the early stages of motherhood, first time mom to three, oh, three month old twins. God bless. Exclusively breastfeeding and exhausted. Okay. So like just one three month old whew, is a lot. It's a lot. And it's funny, like a lot of people think that I just dropped massive amounts of weight and was like vibrant right away. No, <laughs> no, I was a hot mess in the beginning with my son. It was hard. You just have to do the best that you can. Follow those tips I was talking about earlier in the episode and congratulations. That's just beautiful. Wonderful. I'm so happy for you. I hope you and the babies are doing really well, um, but do the best that you can. I really strongly recommend the water and wellness. Again, not medical advice. I know I keep saying that, but I just want to, you know, keep everybody in that understanding. Water and wellness, Keenton, Q-U-I-N-T-O-N, um, pregnancy protocol. Do that during breastfeeding even more so. I think I required more minerals breastfeeding than I did pregnancy. Um, because it's taking minerals, it's leaching minerals, it's leaching nutrients from your body. Don't focus on the weight loss. I get a lot of weight loss questions in my private community. Cause I, again, like I said, I have a lot of pregnant and a lot of postpartum moms in my community. Everyone's ready for the weight loss. I didn't lose any weight. Hardly. I lost some weight, some inflammation that came down from having the baby, but I really didn't start losing a lot of weight until I was done breastfeeding. And my breastfeeding journey ended abruptly with my daughter being in the ICU for a week and I couldn't manage it. I couldn't keep it up. And I felt really bad about it because um, I just, I felt devastated. Like I failed my son and I had this whole plan of motherhood's going to be this different way. I did it, you know, wrong the first time. I'm going to get it right the second time. And I didn't get it perfect. I did definitely give my son a lot better of a chance than I did my daughter in many regards in the ways that I knew I was going to and I planned for, but the breastfeeding thing threw me for a loop, but I didn't really start to lose weight until I stopped the breastfeeding. Um, so think postpartum again as a time of nourishment and rest as much as you can. It was just a conversation in my private community this morning and it was like, okay, um, the only time I have that to work out is 4 30 5 o'clock in the morning i have a new baby and a toddler and i'm like don't work out i know this is very contrary to a lot of what's going to be put out there don't work out right now sleep at 4 30 and 5 in the morning if your kids are sleeping you need to be sleeping you need to be resting during postpartum and not focusing on um, snapping back you need to nourish yourself and nourish your body the amount of health issues that women have postpartum because they're trying to snap back and restrict is astounding. You need minerals, you need rest, you need nutrients. You need to not worry about losing the weight or any of the other stuff and do your best. Don't go on your phone. Don't scroll at night. Um, don't just do your best. Nourish. Think nourishment. Think rest as much as you possibly can. Um, how do you get enough fiber in the winter if you're only eating the seasonal produce in your area, which is mainly just carrots and potatoes? Well, carrots and potatoes have a good amount of fiber. They do. 
Uh, I also think that fermented foods are really great in the winter as well. And yeah, your potatoes, your squash, your cellar, cellar stable f- foods are really, really, really helpful. And they, they have pretty much adequate fiber. Remember your gut microbiome shifts in the winter and this is in response to UV light and it shifts in response to temperature, red and near infrared. So light matters in the winter. If you're getting that appropriate light signaling, your microbiome is going to shift and change. You don't have to be perfect, right? You don't have to, once you start doing this stuff for a while, it doesn't have to be the strict regimented perfect thing. Um, and if you're not leptin resistant, uh, you might be okay with some grains like from Dr. Tom Cowan's. I think he's got like a, a whole little grocery store of like oats and things that are soaked, like ancient grains. You might be okay with those. Those are some extra ways to get fiber if you feel that you need it. But yeah, carbs, uh, you know, your potatoes and carrots have a good amount of fiber in them. Let's see. And this is another question about lipedema. I've been diagnosed twice by experts in the field, but I've always felt there has been another way to tackle this other than surgery and compression all the time. It runs in my family and I have three daughters and my mother has severe lipedema. My mother's actually had a leg amputated, not due to lipedema, due to other issues. But yes, it's definitely, definitely runs in the family. Like I said, with mitochondria, when mitochondria get stressed enough, that's when these things get expressed. You might not have a mitochondria uh, epigenetic um, predisposition to lip- lipedema or XYZ condition, but <clears throat> reverse and halt this for me and my kiddos. I know you mentioned being diagnosed at one point. Do you think you're, yes, I was definitely diagnosed accurately. I definitely had all the symptoms. I definitely had a lot of pain in my legs. Um, if so, I'd say you found the only cure so far, and I'm interested in more information specifically on lipedema, connective tissue disorders, and in the eyes of quantum biology. So yeah, I mean, again, it's supporting the mitochondria and exclusion zone water. When we don't have adequate exclusion zone water, we are 99% water molecule by volume. This is why cold has a quantum effect on the body. This is why our intentions, our thoughts, our moods have a quantum effect on the body because of this water in the body. So we have to support mitochondria and we have to support exclusions on water. And when you're supporting one, you're supporting the other most of the time. So I did talk about this earlier on in the episode, but number one, I was in a severe case and, you know, so take that into account, but I do have a family history of it. One of my sisters has it pretty severely. Um, not doing, she's not doing a lot of the stuff that I'm doing. Unfortunately, I hope that she will one day want to, but I'm not here to tell anyone what to do in my family. I'm it's attraction, not promotion. Um, but I would, you know, like it sounds very simplistic, but I would do all of the basics, all of the things, and I can definitely help more in, uh, my private community. Let's see, circadian health and viruses. I've been doing all the things for nearly a year now and have been struck with viral pneumonia. Sorry to hear that. Is um, I feel extremely disappointed with my immune system as I have been feeling so good and gradually losing weight and definitely heading in the right direction. This is not just a sniffle. I've been confined to bed rest with literally no energy. The best I can do is be on the lounge near the open door. That's perfect. Rest. And don't you know, don't beat yourself up. When we ha- when we get sick, I think the body is trying to upgrade. I think the body is trying to get rid of something and it's a, res- you know, it's some sort of a response. I think we should get sick every now and then. Um, this sounds pretty serious, so I'm so sorry. But yes, do what you can. Be on the lounge near the open door. O- let- move your bed over to the window. Open the window in the morning so you really get that morning sunlight. Um, I've also been able to sit outside for breakfast and lunch, but the breeze is too cool and it makes me cough. I would wrap up, wrap up with a blanket, get the circadian signaling. You're still going to get infrared. I can't ground at home. I had been walking on the beach barefoot in the water every day for an hour. So I haven't been doing any, it's been two weeks already. And I've read that some of these viruses can take a month before returning to normal. Will all of my hard work be undone? No, it will not. It will not. Um, I've been using the red light torch on my sore throat and ears, but I have not felt any improvement. Um, I will keep doing what you're doing and remember the quantum impact of our thoughts and our emotions. And I know that sounds like very Pollyanna, but it is very true. 
and you've not done undone all your hard work. I get that a lot in my community. Have I undone everything? Um, no, you have not undone everything. So minerals, hydration, rest as much as you need to, you know, get near an open door, an open window, wrap yourself up. And it's kind of like the postpartum period, nourishment and rest. Those are going to be your best friends. Okay. Um, let's see. After seeing the sunrise, I still need to cook and do stuff with light. In that case, should I still wear the blue blockers? It just depends on your light environment. I have a ton of windows in my house, so I'll often crack a window and do what I need to do. And I've got a lot of natural light coming in, but I also have like, um, these bug zappers that, that are UV, they're like, uh, below 400 nanometers. And I'll have, I have some red light bulbs around the house. So I have some circadian friendly lighting. Uh, but I don't stress about that so much in the morning In the day, I would just have a source of infrared. Like if you can crack a window open, I would do that. Um, and use circadian friendly bulbs. So I wouldn't stress about it too much. Let's see, getting morning light and being outside is helping with my long COVID, but I still have a cortisol dip in the afternoon from two to four, making it hard to function. I read in the light doctor that violet light in the afternoon might help and was just an example scenario. Any thoughts on getting my cortisol up in the afternoons? Um, taking caffeine or deep rest sometimes helps, but I worry that it's causing more problems. I mean, have you done a saliva cortisol test? That would be my question because you, do you know that that's actually what's happening? Are you having a blood sugar issue from your diet? I, I would just be curious about that because sometimes we think it's something, but we haven't really, we don't really know. And so before you take an adaptogen and, or you drink coffee or you do something like that, it'd be helpful to know what it is. And sunlight is a beautiful adaptogen. So if you can go outside in that time and do some grounding, um, you're going to get POM C to cleave, which is going to stimulate alpha, beta, gamma, MSH, beta endorphin, serotonin, dopamine, and can actually help with cortisol production as well to make the right amount of cortisol. So I would literally would go outside if you can, um, if you, because light sunlight is an adaptogen and you're going to get the correct circadian signaling for time of day, time of year. And then to be sure I would test, I would work with somebody. Um, I also for, you know, for some things, I think homeopathy is lovely. I love homeopathy. And so that can be very, very supportive is finding a good homeopath and working with them for things like, uh, quote unquote viruses and illnesses and cortisol. If you're doing all the quantum circadian stuff, your blood sugar is in balance. You've got a healthy blood sugar levels. Sometimes doing a little bit of homeopathy can be really helpful, helpful also. Let's see. You talk a lot about people living in Northern latitudes. That's just mostly the people that come out of the woodwork. Anytime I talk about circadian health, what about those of us living closer to the equator here in Hawaii, 21 latitude? We do not see many climate changes in fall or winter aside from shorter days. Should we be shifting our diet to prepare for the seasons? I mean, local seasonal is typically your best bet, really. Like, so if you're in Hawaii and you're not leptin resistant, eat what's available to you and just, you know, uh, utilize circadian meal timing. So you still want to have a good time away from bedtime without food. And, um, yeah, I mean, that's the beauty of the equator is you've got, and if you're in Hawaii, you've got grounding sun, the ocean, or you've got a lot of strong UV light. So your body is better able to deplete deuterium. And you don't have to deal with like extreme temperature changes and shifts and all of that. So it's a, it, it can, it can be great. Um, I'm just, I don't think I'm going to get through all these questions. I'm so sorry. There's so many of them and I feel like I've been going for a little while now, but I may have to do a part two. Uh, my question is this, are the benefits of UVA light more optimal closer to its rise? Do they lessen the closer you get to UVB rise? I realize UVA is present through a lot of the day and I'm curious what the optimal window might be. UVA rise is really magic because that is when UV comes online. And so it can be really helpful if you can get UV when it's rising. So right when the sun hits 10 degrees, I know not everyone's going to be able to do that. So morning UVA, 
is going to give your brain some really, really, really helpful, important neurotransmitter and neurohormone support um, that you want those hormones to kind of be surging and UV can actually put the brakes on cortisol as well. So if you're like making too much of it going out in that morning, UV can help to regulate your cortisol levels and your sex steroid hormones, uh, thyroid. There's a lot of really wonderful benefits of going out in morning UVA. Obviously you're going to get benefits, as I mentioned in one of the previous questions from afternoon UV light. Uh, again, it's like an adaptogen, think of it that way, but it's really, really important to kind of bring things online in the morning. And I did do a little bit of a longer video where I break this down on the My Circadian app YouTube channel. And I'm trying to do videos about every single part of the day on the channel. So stay tuned for that. Um, I've seen you test sunlight coming in through an open window in your new app. Are the readings the same on a window that is cracked versus open several inches? No, if your window, and so here's the thing, light can travel through cracks, but with a lux meter, the more open the window is, the more lux you're going to get. But infrared and red can still get in through, uh, and UV can still get in through a crack. So circadian benefits and red and infrared getting in, they can get in through the cracks. But if you want like optimal lux, you want to open the window wide open. Um, separate question is IPL technology that targets melanin in your hair follicles and destroys it. So hair won't regrow something that could potentially have undesirable effects down the line. Interesting. I've never really looked into that. Um, yeah, if it's targeting the melanin in your hair, I don't know if we want to necessarily destroy melanin. That's a really good question because melanin does so many great things like sequester heavy metals. There's neuroprotective benefits of melanin. Uh, we'll have to look into that one a little bit further. That's a really interesting question. I like to read one outside but need readers. Does that block the light from getting in? And if so, any suggestions? I mean, I would just take breaks from them. You know, like if you have regular glasses, just take breaks, get natural light, and you're still going to be getting a ton of benefits on your skin. You're looking down at the paper, so you can always pull the glasses down to the end of your nose, look down at what you're reading, and then take a, a break to look up every now and then. But I would enjoy your outdoor reading time and not, not worry about it too much. I'm going to get to a couple more of these and then I'm probably going to have to do a part two because there's so many amazing questions here. And I know I've missed some of the ones that I saw and I was like, oh, that's a great question. Um, do we have to do sport on an empty? No, I wouldn't do. I don't recommend a lot of um, faster workouts. What do you use for your hair? I honestly to use toxic crap, but I only wash my hair once a week. I went a year of no shampoo. Actually, I I think like 18 months of no shampoo. But when I had my baby, had all the medical issues with my daughter, I just was like, my hair smells really bad. I've got baby puke in it. I'm just going to use, I use Aveda. I know there's better stuff like living libations I've heard is really good, but I haven't, I just haven't gotten to it yet. Uh, but I do really nourish my body and give myself a lot of minerals. So what's happening on the inside is going to impact your hair on the outside. Um, I don't really use cosmetics, but if I use a little mascara, my friend Erin, the natural minded mama on Instagram has got some good cosmetics that are clean and raw vegetables or not raw. It depends on time of year. I would not do raw vegetables in the winter, but in the summer, you might be a little bit more okay if your digestive system is healthy and you're getting appropriate circadian signaling. Um, let's see. I think that was all of that one. We need UVA, but I worry about skin aging, wrinkles, and sunspots. Will red light therapy cause skin aging? No. Red light therapy can actually boost collagen production in the skin. And when we're in UV, we're getting red and infrared as well. You can overdo sun exposure. And it's also dependent on your stress levels, mineral balance, your diet, circadian rhythms. Like so many things go into this topic of skin aging beyond just the light hitting your skin. Like what other, like I said, I ha, I got the skin pigmentation that I noticed after I had my son. Well, that was pretty stressful to go through a whole pregnancy. We moved. My daughter was starting to have health problems at the time. So yeah, that was, that, that caused that. So, um, I would not wear a visor in front of red light therapy, but if you were worried about, um, UV damage, I'd wear a visor or a hat. 
uh, definitely. I'd get a little in my eyes, but I, you could wear a visor or a hat there. But red light therapy, I do recommend now people possibly wear goggles if their eyes are sensitive. I'm having more and more people that need to wear the goggles. So yeah, but I wouldn't wear a visor in front of red light. Um, let's see. This is a protein question. You recommend, uh, okay. So she basically for protein, and this is a starting place and it's not dietary advice is going to work for everyone. But for most women, I say take your desired body weight and, uh, put that in kilograms, desired body weight in kilograms times 1.5. As a starting place, if you're still hungry, if you're pregnant, if you're breastfeeding, if you're aging, if you do a lot of weight training, if you're very active, you're going to need more. You're going to play with that and add more, but that's just a starting point. So this person has calculated uh, her desired protein. It sounds pretty low. I want to make sure if I eat enough calories to not make my leptin resistance worse. And that I'm talking about grams in the US metric system. So the grams... I've had this a lot. People in like Europe, they're like 70 grams. That's like nothing. That's like three bites. Well, I'm talking about the, the U S metric system. So you're going to have to convert that. So what I say in grams is probably a lot different than the way that you guys measure the grams on in, uh, in Europe. So make sure that you're estimating that appropriately. Okay. I'm having elective plastic surgery in two weeks. The doctor wants to put me on an antibiotic after the procedure and really scared about the risks of not taking it. I'm against them, but I don't want complications. What would you do? Um, I don't know. I would really just weigh out the, the pros and cons of this, to be honest with you. And I can't give medical advice or, or medication advice here on the show, but, um, you know, i if that was me and it was, I didn't have an active infection, I would be, I would look at the risks of antibiotics. So that's a hard question for me to answer on the show and give like publicly, to be honest with you. My thoughts on iodine. I think that iodine um, can have some benefits, but you gotta be careful with it because people can overdo iodine and it can lead to Hashimoto's. So Working one-on-one -on -one with somebody, doing an HTMA, testing to see if you are actually low on iodine, trying to get as much iodine from your food sources like wild seafood, um, that's going to be really helpful. Um, it, how do you wake up for sunrise when you have your bedroom completely blacked out? You just you're you might have to set an alarm the first few days, but I naturally wake up at sunrise time now. I have everything blacked out. My body is very synced up to the sun, and it does shift throughout the year. So. Go outside. You might have to set an alarm the first few days, but then your body will eventually sync up. Um, let's see. What metrics do you use to gauge health? You often mention body weight, but don't stress any specific indications on body fat. How can you conceptualize progress? How can you assess what's working and what isn't? First thing I'm going to say is how's your energy and how's your sleep? Those things are really, really important. And that's what I tell people that do my leptin program is like, First, you're going to notice better energy. Then you're going to notice better sleep. Those two things typically are like the, the metrics that you want to go by. Um, and then your energy throughout the day. Are you having energy crashes? Are you able to get up in the morning and have sustained energy without coffee? Are you, re are you like relying on coffee? Um, those are typically how I measure progress beyond like is the scale moving? Are you losing weight? Do you, how do you feel? Honestly, um, we are so, I think in our society, like we have to have a number on the scale or the aura ring to say a number or the Apple watch to give us a certain metric, but I don't even need an aura ring anymore. I know if I had a crappy night of sleep, I know if I'm not well rested, um, if you're going to wear an aura ring, put it on airplane mode, but those would be something to check your HRV, um, and, and really looking at metrics like that beyond just like body weight, body fat, that's the one everyone looks at. That's the one everyone's obsessed with. So I talk about it, but it's more important to sleep well and have good energy and sustained energy throughout the day. So you're not needing to rely on caffeine and eating all the time and sugar. Chronic migraines. Um, 
I would look at mineral balance, honestly. That's something I would really look at your mineral balance because a lot of migraines are caused by chronic dehydration. A lot of stuff is caused by chronic dehydration. And this can mean low exclusion zone water. Uh, you might be pouring in all the minerals, but you're around a lot of blue light and non-native EMF and a lot of stress. And so your body's just like losing water constantly. So that's something I would, um, I would really look at. Um, let's see, toxins. How does quantum biology integrate removal of heavy metals, mold, et cetera? Is it hydration? Yes, it is. It's exclu exclusion zone water and mitochondrial function. Those are how we integrate the removal a lot of those because exclusion zone by nature excludes those things, pulls them out. Um, this person says, I'm a patient of functional medicine using PC and balance oil for two years. I don't feel like that has made a difference, but two weeks of drinking molecular hydrogen and my rosacea cleared. I love this. Like, I love this because hydrogen is a selective antioxidant. And when I talked to Dr. LeBaron, we talked about the possibility of it building exclusion zone water. So it can help the body to naturally detoxify. And I've had people come on the channel and say, if your daughter truly had mold, if she has mold, then you're going to have to do a formal detox protocol. And I don't believe that. I, I, I don't necessarily believe that. I think you can do a lot with building exclusion zone water, with sweating and using binders like a Takasumi binder um, to pull that stuff out. And we underestimate the power of the body to heal and supporting these things through, through sur proper circadian signaling, grounding, things like hydrogen. The hydrogen inhalation has been like a miracle. Uh, we still haven't run the mold mycotoxin test for my daughter just because it's expensive. It's like 500 bucks or something <laughs> like that. And I'm like, I don't really want to buy this, uh, but I, I will. I will do that to let all of you know, does she still test for, I think it was a gut zoomer that we used uh, where the mycotoxins came back really high. Um, so I'll let you know, I'll let you know, did the hydrogen pull that out? Did it change it? But you know, it's all case by case. It's all a matter of working with someone who can talk about your lifestyle, your history and all that. But the fact that this person started drinking hydrogen water and, and their rosacea is gone in two weeks and they've been doing these other things for, for two years, it, it, it means something. We got to listen to stories like this. And so there's a tremendous amount that can be done, I think, for our health by supporting these base things. And then if you do want to do, I always say, redox before you detox. Support your mitochondria. Support these natural ways of detoxifying. First, build exclusion zone water. Create a healthy environment for mitochondria. And then if you want to do some sort of uh, heavy metal detox or some sort of a detox, then your body's not going to freak out and you're not going to go backwards 10 steps like you would if you didn't support the foundations. Um, can you talk more about the building biologist that visited your home and if you found that to be helpful? There were a lot of things that having a, because I did a newsletter recently that said um, a building biologist told me to move and what I did. Um, I didn't move. I'm still here. I do want to move, but not necessarily due to what the building biologist told me, mostly due to because I really don't want to live in the city anymore. And I really don't like the city. And I have a neighbor that is like, just very not cool. I'm not going to go into that on the podcast. But unfortunately, I have a neighbor that is very disruptive in my lovely, beautiful home here. But aside, a uh, building biologist did come here and said, you've got these really bad power lines out in front. You've got cars passing by constantly and you're close to a close to a tower closer than I would like a home to be to a tower there's measuring a lot of non-native EMF even though you've done the hard wiring even though you unplug things even though you've done a lot to mitigate the indoors of your house and shielding paint and all of that it's still really like not, if you can move move and he didn't say it like in a mean or threatening way like I think he he and he did give me some helpful tips um with moving different things, unplugging different things. Uh, you know, I didn't realize Bluetooth was on on my laptop. That's why I always talk about Bluetooth, turning the Bluetooth off of all your devices and not wearing any Bluetooth because Bluetooth, when you see like a professional, it's bigger, better than a Trifield 2 EMF meter. But when you see a professional EMF meter going off, um, it's like, whoa, and my computer was huge. So there were a lot of things that 
um, it was helpful to see and make shifts and little small changes around moving the baby's bed to the other side of the room. Like there were some things that I could do. Uh, so I do think the building biologists are very valuable and helpful, uh, because not everyone can move, but I still believe in, I still, now that I'm studying biogeometry and quantum physics at the level of people like Dan Winter and all the guys at the Cosmic Tower, the wellness enterprise, they're doing some really great uh, videos right now of understanding the ether, understanding this other layer of science that our regular science, which I think is kind of a religion, by the way, can't explain, right? And by the way, regular science is just touching the iceberg with non-native EMF. They don't totally understand what it does to our exclusion zone water. It's multifaceted and multi-layered. And so just to say, I think the building biologists are very valuable and can really help to reduce hazards, especially if you're very electrosensitive. I think harmonizing is also very helpful if you can't necessarily move. Um, so there were a lot of things that the building biologists helped me adjust in the home when I thought I had done a lot of things. Let's see. I'm going to answer a couple more and then uh, I might just have to do a part two <laughs> of this because there's so many questions and I always feel so guilty if I can't get to all of them. But this episode would be like five hours long and I don't know if anyone would listen to that. <laughs> um, let's see. I'm on page 90 of Pollock's Fourth Phase of Water, which is a really great book to read if you want to understand water on this deeper level. He states that walls absorb radiant energy from sun and re-emit this energy at different wavelengths. In turn, inside your walls emit plenty of infrared where whether the lights are turned on or off, infrared is always present. If this is true, why do we need to go outside to get infrared light in the morning? Is it really all around us? Well, our mitochondria and we, our bodies emit infrared. Our bodies are always emitting infrared and things, objects emit infrared, but it's the strength and power of the infrared outside that has the power to uh, expand the exclusion zone water inside of our bodies. But we can also expand exclusion zone water from cuddling, um, from being next to somebody who is just like this magnetic, you know how people say they're magnetic. Think about that. Um, a really like amazing person that you're around or something that you listen to, sound, vibration can encourage exclusion zone water production and um, help it maintain its integrity. So there, yeah, there's infrared all around us, but we need a, a certain amount of power of infrared light in order to encourage easy water expansion, production, um, and mitochondrial biogenesis. So I hope that makes sense. All right, a couple more. At my local farmer's market, I can get local, seasonal, but not organic. Would that be preferred to a seasonal organic or to say at Whole Foods? I would always talk to the farmer or, or visit the farm if you can. I know that's not going to be feasible for a lot of people, but to get a label, you have to pay people. It's expensive. Um, and so they may not be going through all these extra regulations to get a label of organic, but it might be something that's qualified as organic or not sprayed. So I would always talk to the farmer that you're buying from. Um, so yeah, that, that's my opinion on that. Recommendations for high candida overgrowth. I would support mitochondrial function and exclusions on water and look at doing a low, no sugar diet for a period of time, but you also want to support your microbiome. So uh, grounding, sunlight, sleep, circadian rhythms, all of that. Why? What's the root cause of the candida? What's causing your body to make that? It's a protective mechanism. So what in your environment, and I can't answer that necessarily, what in your environment is encouraging that growth? Because it's, it's some sort of a protective mechanism going on in your body. That's how I look at things now. I would love to hear your recommendations for managing everything you teach with toddlers and children. I mean, I just involve them as much as possible. As my, my son loves to wear my blue blocker glasses. It's so cute. He loves them. I take them outside with me. I teach them. Um, we limit screens. We open windows. And we let them eat what we eat. I try not to like – my son doesn't eat puffs and crackers and toddler foods. Uh, part of that is that he's – 
he we're working through some um, food sensitivity stuff with him still. And I'll talk about that in a future episode because he had a little bit of eczema. I think it was due to trauma, due to a lot of stuff going on with my daughter, but his body is like reacts to a lot of foods. So some of that is like, I don't buy him anything from a box or process because I don't know what it's going to do to his skin, but I still don't, and he's thriving. So do kids need all these little crackers and cookies and cakes and like baby toddler foods? He can gnaw on a piece of meat. Like he has been eating meat off the bone since he was a baby. Um, so that, I mean, I really just, they just try to, we try to do, involve them in what we do. Thankfully, my husband is now starting to come on board. We take him outside with us in the morning. We dim the lights at home. We try to bring in circadian lighting for our kids because my son, like he's starting to really be interested in my blue blockers. But for the most part, I keep the house dim. I'll use Edison style incandescents. So things like that. Okay. I will probably do a part two because there are still a lot of questions and we've been going for one hour and 36 minutes. So I will probably do a part two. But thank you so much for listening. Um, I Hopefully my person that helps me do my podcast will put some resources down in the show notes of things that I mentioned. And thank you everyone for all of your questions. I'll definitely do another one of these sooner rather than later. Thank you so much for listening to the Evolving Wellness Podcast. Just a quick little reminder, this is not medical advice nor meant to be taken as a substitute for working one-on-one with a healthcare practitioner. And if you enjoy the show, please head on over to Apple or Spotify to leave the show up to a five-star review. If you're over on YouTube, please leave us a like, leave us a comment. I really appreciate you for being here, for listening to the show and your support means the world to me as I continue to try to pull guests from around the world to bring you informative content to empower you to make decisions about your own health. Thank you so much for being here and I look forward to seeing you again next week.